you're currently in the process of doing a, a, a road show with the Sandlot, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a twenty. It's uh, we call it the twentieth anniversary Sandlot tour, and uh, my good buddies at uh, Fox Home Entertainment are taking care of all the marketing and publicity and logistics stuff um, in conjunction with all of the baseball teams that have signed up to uh, have screenings, um, mostly after a game, like on a Friday or Saturday, which is quite awesome. It's worked out. Um, you know, they filled, let's say, for instance, an example is we, the first one we did was Trenton, New Jersey, Arm & Hammer Park, which is the home of the Trenton Thunder. And, uh, oh, boy, they probably have it. The stadium probably seats about maybe 6,500, maybe a little bit more or whatnot. And on the day, uh, they just about filled the place. And uh, just the game got done. I do go down on the uh, infield and with, a, with a mic and do a sort of a Sandlot trivia contest and give away a bunch of cool Sandlot stuff and, you know, interact with the audience. And then uh, just as it starts to get, uh, you know, dusk or dark, we uh, show the movie. And they had, um, I believe it was 68 feet, might have been 70 Super high definition jumbotron. It's the single largest screen I've ever seen in the movie on. It was absolutely incredible. It's awesome. What is that sensation like to watch your movie with a crowd of sixty five hundred people? Um, it's really out of body, you know. Over the years, many, many, many thousands at least of people have said, "Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta show that movie in its natural habitat, a baseball stadium," you know. So if you're thinking about the early nineties, mid nineties, that would have involved. Uh, putting up a screen in the outfield because the jumbotrons, of course, weren't weren't so terrific in those days. Now they're you know just like the set you have in your in your living room. And uh, so last year we did a couple little trial runs where I actually did get a blow up movie screen and put it in the outfield of Werner Park in Omaha and another one in Kearney, uh, Nebraska. And that those went really really well with virtually no publicity. Just a you know on the day of I did a little bit of radio stuff. Uh, through 30, about 3,500 people showed up at Werner and 25 or so in Kearney. And then we did one more at uh, AutoZone Park in Memphis, Tennessee, home of the Redbirds, which that place is huge. It suits maybe, I don't know, 12,000. And if they fill up the hilly, grassy areas, maybe 14,000. And we got a good 4,000 people or something like there. And they have a really tidy jumbotron. So that was the first time I saw it on a nice HD jumbotron. And it was... Um, it was just, I don't know, it, 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 the movie just seems to belong there and yeah. in its sort of little baseball Camelot kind of space, you know, and, and watching it from, from any place and hearing the sound. They have great sound system there and stuff. I just walking around just feeling like the most grateful human being on planet Earth. Mm, mm. I just, well, I, 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 it's, you know. And I'm, I'm sure that they're grateful for you, uh, grateful to you, and grateful for this movie. I, I, I'm curious because it is the 20th anniversary. When did it occur to you that your movie had legs, that it was living, and it was becoming a kind of a generational film? Probably, let's say the initial domestic theatrical release had a whole lot of eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve-year-old fans. So probably a decade after that, when those guys and girls were in college, you know, the email thing became more a part of everybody's life. I started getting in, you know, incredible numbers of emails, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Thank, thank, thank you, greatest baseball movie ever made. Then it was greatest movie ever made. Then best summer movie of all time and all this sort of thing. So I always had this sense um, because of that and because I'd hear my movie quoted. All over the world, in, in airports, um, in, you know, in, in a restaurant, uh, parents saying, you know, you're killing me, small, to their, to their kids or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just incredible. And uh, I'll tell you a story about a dude in, uh, in Denver International in a minute. But, uh, and then, of course, the numbers. I mean, every year that a new platform, first it was VHS, then there was the Laserdisc thing for a little while. Then DVD came out, then Blu-ray, and every time a new platform came out, this thing would sell and sell and sell and sell and sell. And every year it sells more than it did the year before. And it became this evergreen film is what they call it at Fox, mm. all over really. But And um, so, I mean, if I had to guess, you know, there's, I don't know, the upside of 100 million DVDs out there around the world. And that's the other thing is I uh, these emails wouldn't just come from um, – 
folks in the U.S., you're talking Russia, um, Australia, Japan, Italy, um, bunches of different countries in Africa. Um, mm. uh, it, it, I get a lot of stuff from people uh, behind uh, the old Iron Curtain, you know, the Eastern European countries um, love it. Um, and it sort of, it transcends baseball film, although, you know, certainly it's been called that, and, and it is to a certain extent that. But baseball movies generally do not play well overseas because baseball is a really uniquely American sport. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people around the world, you know, they may play it, but it's, it's you know, rugby and soccer are the big things all every place else in the world. But this one's not like that, you know. It is a huge, huge favorite all over the world. I'm so from, from you, but but when you're talking about how this movie has captured the hearts of people all across the globe, what do you think are the universal truths in your movie that that, that are speaking to them? You know, that's I'm glad you asked me that because somebody asked me something akin to that a few weeks ago, and I said, "Do you really want me to get all PhD about it?" And they go, no. So, so I didn't. So now I will. Okay. <laughs> Please do. Please uh, do. It's, it, look, it, it has, I think, if you want to go deep down, you know, there's uh, psychological film theory about the mirror stage and all that, that when we're all collectively together in a dark movie theater, when we're watching this movie, this story, and we're collectively experiencing it, it harkens back to those deep sort of primal infant mirror stages where you're looking at mommy and daddy's face imitating him and you know what the hell you're doing, but you're experiencing that. So it starts there and it goes up into that Jungian universal subconscious thing that it touches people no matter who you are, what you are, what ethnicity you are, where you live, what your uh, particular circumstances or specific life experiences were. If you grew up playing stickball or any other kind of sport, you know, on the streets of Brooklyn, you get it. You get these kids. If you grew up in the Midwest where you were planted out, you know, in a pasture on a farm or whatever, you get it. You get these kids. Um, And I think it's because you either were these kids or really wanted to be those kids in a a sort of generalized fashion. Why does it still and always will, I think, resonate? Well, because it deals with something. It's not, you know, it's, it's a movie against... Um, it's a story against the background of which there is baseball. Baseball as a sport, more than any other sport, is my opinion. Um, you can sum up, I think, and again, I'm you know I get all PhD and you know I don't know heart health about it, but I will. <laughs> you know, is it's this? It's the, you know, uh, football is a war. You know, to some yeah. extent, basketball is as well. Baseball is not. Baseball is like a life, you know. There are long stretches where a whole lot of nothing happens, followed by, you know, explosive moments of, oh, boy, here we go, that kind of stuff. And I think life and baseball are, and I didn't say this, it was uh, Ron Shelton, I think, in a recent article I read, because they interviewed him for Bull Durham or some something. He says, look, it's a single word. It's hope. It's hope. Mm-hmm. Every spring, you know, season changes, life uh, uh, finds a way to come back, and baseball starts, you know. And then all through the summer, we're sort of, you know, feeling our oats and all that sort of thing. We have our big contests at sort of fall time when uh, life for a certain, in a certain way, is shutting down or going dormant for a little while. Uh, but we always know it's going to come back. Yeah. So in that sense, I think you, you would think that all baseball films would have that sort of thing, and they don't. But again, I don't think the Sandlot's really a baseball movie. It's a movie about friendship. And it's yeah. a movie about not leaving a man behind. And it's a movie about including people and not being a bully. I mean, I, I know that's sort of in the vogue and zeitgeist right now. And, you know, you know, the bullying that kids deal with today over the Internet and social media and stuff is, is as bad or worse than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was just full-on physical bullying, you know. You just got beat up all the time. Right. Uh, me too. And, and that's the way it was for me and my little brother when I was a kid. And that's one of the reasons I wrote The Sandlots, because I really hated those guys on that block. I just, man, I wanted to get back at them really bad. You know, and you carry that stuff around long enough, and if you've got half a brain, you, you recognize it starts to darken your soul, and you got to do something about it. So I have no idea what happened to them. I don't care. Whatever. But I needed to do something for me, and that was this cathartic, you know, artistic artist thing was 
I'm going to write them out of my system by forgiving them and turning them into heroes. And that's essentially what I did. Mm. You know, and there's also something about films that are genuinely good-hearted. Uh, we have so few of those now. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a tonal thing because a lot of times when people try to duplicate what you achieve in something like The Sandlot, uh, it comes across as schmaltzy and, and maybe yep. the, fakely sentimental and sweet. Um, h- how did you avoid that? How did, how did you find the, the truth and the good nature of, of the piece? I think it starts with the point of view you come at life or or your work as an artist, and that is my thing has always been honesty and authenticity. Um, I didn't seek to do Home Alone, which, by the way, I love. It's hysterical. But it just wasn't it. I mean, the movie is essentially from nine, you know, 11, 12, and 13-year-old kids' points of view, both individually and as a unit. Um, And I'm very, very, have a very, very good memory. I'm very in touch with that time in my life. And it's uh, super fertile ground. I mean, because I wrote about, I wrote (laughs) actually in another movie I did, Radio Flyer, the script in there has this little section called... um, the seven great abilities and fascinations. And there is, when you're a kid, you, you know what these are and you, you can do them. You know, you can have a blanket that is an impenetrable force field. You can jump off a roof with an umbrella and float safely to the ground and you can fly and all that sort of thing. And the reason that those things, those really very true, honest, real reality things that you can do when you're that age and that the adults don't know about them is because in the quick second between, and this is what I said in the piece, was between the ages of 12 and 13, all of those secrets to those great things are replaced in your mind by thoughts of the opposite sex or these days, you know, you, you mature. You, you walk out of childhood, in other words. That's what it was meant to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I still know all those things, and I'm not bragging. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> and no, I'm not saying I can fly. I am not crazy, um, at least not much. But... I'm very, it, 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 it left a very, very, very um, powerful impact on me those years, yeah. both for very, very good reasons and very, very not so good reasons. And I'm very in touch with that. And having then had four kids of my own and, you know, look, that's immortality, right? That's all we get. You, you, when we leave here, you're two things. You're, what did you leave behind? If you left kids behind, terrific. That's your immortality. But really what it is is memories. So... Yeah. I'm very, very big on memories. So that's why I think I was able to imbue it with that sort of stuff. And, of course, casting it correctly um, and finding kids whom I didn't force to become characters that I wrote, but found kids with honest, outgoing, gregarious, effusive personalities that were just them, and then sort of crafting, letting them do that, you know, read lines and say stuff and move and, 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 and perform as if they weren't doing it at all, just being themselves and, and fixing up dialogue and stuff to befit them without losing sight of what I wanted to say, I think had a, a lot to do with it. I'm curious to know, because you were talking about your memories of childhood, um, at what time did films come into your consciousness and what role did they play for you? Films saved my life. Movies saved my life. And they continue to save my life. A very, very, like I said, not so good childhood. And any time I could, by the time I was in those days, if you were like 10, 11 years old, my brother's a couple years old, uh, excuse me, younger than me, we could get on a bus um, from where we lived in the uh, northeastern San Fernando Valley and uh, not have a dollar between us or maybe even less than that. And it was like a quarter to ride the bus, but, you know, we were <laughs> such a pitiful little guys. The bus drivers usually just let us ride for free. Hmm. And we would go to the movies, um, uh, to the Americana Theater or the Panorama City Theater, what like that. And you could get in in those days for like 50 cents on a double uh, bill, you know, with some Harryhausen movies or something like that. Just absolutely great stuff or some Disney films or whatever. And you could sit there all Saturday and watch them, you know, five times each. And you could still get a soda and a bag of sugar babies, you know. Um, and that's when it started for me, um, when it really, really, really hit me. I mean, I I remember this very specifically was the couple days after star Wars came out, was it 77, I believe something like that. Uh, a 
friend, my best friend in junior high, we were seventh or eighth grade. He says, have you seen Star Wars? I said, no, but I'm going to. He says, you got to see it. I'm going to believe it. So I went down like the next day or whatever to the Americana Theater, and I saw, I watched that thing like about four times in a row. I could not believe <laughs> that that was a movie. It was like this, you know, quantum leap in filmmaking, yet it was, you know, this simple story. And uh, that that was it. That sealed the deal for me. Uh, I said, That's, I want to do that. Whatever that is, I want to do that. I want to make that, you know. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because a lot of times when, when people talk about going to the movies as a, as a younger person, they talk about the element of escape, and certainly that's an element that attracts us to that movie-going experience. But there's also, I mean, losing yourself in a movie, but also finding yourself. So when 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 you watched movies as a young person that, that truly moved you and defined your life, what did you find in yourself in these movies? Man, that's a good question. Um, See, I'm going. I'm I'm getting PhD on you. <laughs> no, dude. I'm. Hey, let's go. I got two MAs. I don't have the PhD, but I'll, I'll go there. Uh, um, I uh, personally, I I certainly was escaping. Absolutely. Part of the radio flyer uh, writing process for me was getting back in touch when we were little kids we lived i don't know a block and a half two blocks from a private airport or excuse me not a private airport but a small plane airport and there were hills and stuff around there and i was very very enamored with uh, hawks and eagles and stuff like that and because that sort of thing um watching planes take off and land um even things like at the age of 11 years old taking the bus nine miles away to an rv dealership just to walk around inside those rvs they were very kind to me all in winnebago it, that was escape. I wanted to get in something and get out because, you know, childhood was, it was not a fun time. I mean, a, mm. a lot of uh, physical trouble, so to speak. So going to the movies, yes, was escape. But I also, when, I, when I'd see a movie that was an adventure or this or that, clearly and obviously I wanted to do that. I wanted to be that. I came to identify with that. And, you know, even as a kid, I I had a feeling I was, you know, I wasn't a dummy. I was, you know, it's pretty smart. And I, I disliked what was happening in my child in my life so much. So to the extent that when I saw those movies or movies that had an impact upon me, it was, I can create my own world. I, I, if I can do that, I can, I can do anything I want. I can make life or at least you know, an imitation thereof, exactly the way I want it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I well, it's, started it's an, to pick... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was saying, when I started to pick up, a, you know, I don't know, maybe in junior high or whatever, pick up a pencil and a yellow legal pad and start writing stories, it occurred to me, even then, because one of my favorite old movies was The Time Machine, you know, ah, oh, how good was that? <laughs> and I was always a voracious reader, all oh, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, everything, Ray Bradbury's my all-time favorite, Ray saved my life. Um, when I was a teenager, and uh, I thought, you know, this is a time machine, this this writing thing, and that really came back to me when I sat down to write uh, the Sandlot. Was that I'm going to go back in time, I'm going to change it the way I wanted it to have been, and you know, hopefully, if things go well, that will live forever, and that will be what I say it was, because that's a whole lot better than what it was. You know, there's also there's also this uh, because I, you know, I'm fascinated by the concept of of the artist and his work and how that work uh, is a cathartic, almost therapeutic experience. And I was talking to uh, Pierce Brosnan earlier this week, and we were talking about his new movie, which is about dealing with grief and loss. And he he's dealt with a great deal of that in his own personal life. And he Indeed, yeah. Like he, he can filter that through his work. Um, but honestly, I think – do you think it comes down to the artist does what he does because of the reassurance he receives that he's not alone, that other people understand that they're not alone? Um, yes, and imagine the leap of faith and sheer unadulterated terror that that necessitates because what if <laughs> – you write it, and no one cares. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> or you paint it, and no one cares. You know, um, I saw 
a doc recently, a couple of great docs. One about Wayne White, who was uh, Paul Rubens, uh, you know, Pee Wee Herman's art director and production designer for all those years of Pee Wee's Playhouse. And it's one of the best docs about an artist I've ever seen. Uh, Wayne White, I can't remember the actual name of it, but that's the name. That, that's the guy's name who the doc is about. And he, it, it is really a celebration of art, you know, humor. Um, he's a puppeteer, a voice artist, a painter, um, a sculpture. I mean, a sculptor. I really admire that guy. Um, and he's got, you know, a wife and a couple of kids, and he just continues doing it, just continues doing it because he can't not do it. And the guy, you know, wakes up and all day long he makes puppets and, you know, Mm-hmm. Cool stuff, and 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 it gives joy. Um, but he's had dark moments. Then there was a doc that was sort of the antithesis of that, the flip side of that coin. And I, you, you might be familiar with this. And again, I can't remember the name of the documentary, but it's about an older Japanese sculptor, sculptor, and his wife, who have for what thirty five, forty years, been doing it, been creating art. I mean, the guy's a some kind of otherworldly genius with his with his pieces yet he's utterly broke you know Mm. can't pay the rent the wife after all these years that they've been together is like what are you doing why are you still doing this you know like after 40 years (laughs) you know but somewhere deep inside she still believes in him and there's this one scene where it's like i gotta go i gotta go and he's like a 70 something year old man you live in new york and he's, he says, like, I'm going to Japan to sell some pieces. Hopefully someone will buy one. And they got barely enough money for a plane ticket. And he's sticking his sculptures into these, like, $2, you know, Kmart suitcases yeah. to go make a plane to go to Japan and just try and sell something. So not just so he can eat, so that he can keep doing it. Uh-huh. uh-huh. You know? And, I mean, I was just, just, I, I get him. I, you know, I feel so deeply for that guy. Um, it's uh, you a blessing, not, a person, and affliction. Absolutely, and you can't not do it. And it, I guess, uh-huh. it's someone that, someone that doesn't have those that artistic temperament. They, uh, it's something that would be completely foreign to them. It would seem like a form of insanity, which in a it way is. It, it, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. Yeah, you're. What are you doing? You're wasting your time, you know, yeah, to which, yeah. you know, I would reply, I'm sorry, how's your cubicle working out, you know? <laughs> and that's just it, yeah. Tell me about uh, uh, your own your own children. You said that you have children of your own? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I have four have, kids. Have, have they inherited your your love of film? They have, but they are all very artistic. My oldest son is, and he's a, he's a musician. And he, he's one of those uh, type of people I always wish I could have been. This guy can pick up, I don't care what it is, you, you know, some thousand-year-old musical instrument that hasn't been seen since, you know, unearthed out of some Egyptian tomb, and he can play it. <laughs> wow. He's just one of those guys, you know? And I, I admire that, that he can do that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, my... Uh, he, my uh, next son uh, is as an, a musician as well. He's a drummer. Um, and when he was small, he had a lot of medical problems when he was a kid, almost died and all that. So, but he, he you know, the doctors told him, oh, you know, you just kiss him goodbye. But you never give up, mm. never give up, never yeah. surrender. So he, he survived and thrived. And he is a drummer who, although he has a day job, um, when he was a kid, and he was a small kid because of his being premature and all that, when he was eight, nine, ten years old, he was so good that we would get requests from uh, rock bands. Hey, let him go on tour with us. That was a big no. Uh, you know, uh, but he's a great appreciator of music and, and a great musician. My um, uh, third kid, my the next son, is not so much a uh, a musician, but he is certainly a genius. And he's another, he's like, all my kids have something that I always wish I'd had, which is, I guess, God's way of saying, okay, you know, there you go. They got it. You didn't. He is a guy who can hear somebody speak a foreign language, and in 10 minutes he can talk to them in their language. He's that kind of guy. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he's, and he's going to Korea in about a month or two for, for a few months just to absorb the culture and learn and, you know, 
practice his, uh, his, uh, his Korean and all that. And uh, my daughter, my fourth kid, is literally a genius and plays five, four or five instruments. She's also a writer, uh, still in high school, but a terrific writer. And um, don't know what she's going to end up doing, but whatever it is, I'm pretty confident she's going to have a huge impact on the world. So I'm very, very grateful and blessed and proud of my children. Yeah. That is fantastic. It, it, and, and I'm sure that art gives them, as it's given you, a, a mode of expression. And, I, you know, I, I kind of and it's talked a lot about arts education in schools and stuff, and I think that's really what these kids are missing. They don't have to grow up to actually be musicians or filmmakers or storytellers, uh-huh. but it's a mode of expression that I think that is so valuable, especially for adolescents. Um, so I, I think that's wonderful. Um, I, I, I am in complete agreement, yep, 100%. I, I, I want to ask you one question about Radio Flyer because you delu- sure. alluded to, to it earlier. Uh, obviously, from what you've said, the, the Radio Flyer was an intensely personal story for you, mm-hmm. and I'm sure it was mm-hmm. uh, very close to your heart. Um, w- w- you were originally slated to direct it. I'm sorry, I don't know the story behind it. Yeah, I was. No, that was one of the finest setups in Hollywood history. I, I, I mean, there may have been more uh, painful baptisms by fire in Hollywood, although I'm not aware of any. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was, uh, it's been written about a lot and all that. And I've, I've actually blogged a little bit about this recently. And, um, in fact, the guy who made the deal for me, uh, Paul Kelmus and great guy. I'm still very good friends with him. We've talked about it recently and, and like that. And, and also with, uh, Clint, our, our mutual friend, because, uh, the book that I originally wrote, the novella, upon which I based that screenplay. I got it out after 20-some-odd years and, you know, decided, well, Legacy Publishers is dying. The ebook revolution is here. I can do it, and I can get to the entire world with this book, and I think that it has something uh, incredibly important and inspirational to say about hope and hopelessness. So I fixed it all up and all like that. Um, but, yeah, I was uh, – that was that broke all the records in Hollywood, that spec script sale. And uh, I got the deal, quote unquote, to direct it, and they guaranteed me eight days in the chair, which was great. But it was at a time when Sony was buying Columbia, and the Goober Peter Company was, uh, you know, leaving Warner Brothers and going over to run Columbia, and then Warner Brothers sued Sony for half a billion dollars because of the Batman thing. All this nasty, you know, Hollywood stuff was going on in my little script got caught right in the middle of that cyclone. And, you know, the bidding war went on and all that sort of thing. And uh, at the time, uh, John Peters was so angry at Warner Brothers for that lawsuit that uh, Warner Brothers threw at Sony and got all that money for that he endeavored to poach and headhunt every single major director and star that had a production deal at Warner Brothers where he used to be the boss and bring them all over to Columbia. Okay. Mm. And one of those guys was Richard Donner of whom I am a big fan. And at that exact moment, the one thing on earth that Richard Donner wanted to do the most was radio fire. And Mm. uh, I wanted to direct it, you know? And so I turned down three times as much money for the script as I got for it. But that would have required me stepping aside as director because I really wanted to direct it, you know? And so they gave me eight days, and, you know, the team said, oh, man, you know, that's, that's pretty, it's not unprecedented, but it's pretty good, man. You know, they give you eight days, they're going to let you direct it. And, of course, uh, at the uh, 12th hour, on the eighth day, the boys walk onto my set. I think I was at Lake Hollywood or something shooting a scene. Well, we're going to have to let you go. So they let me go. And I uh, didn't have my car, so I said, so can I, I, I remember this very clearly. There was a uh, very big Hollywood leading man star who was one of the producers and he looks at me and he says, let you go. And I go, yeah, I figured we'll kept you. And, uh, can I get a ride home? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. I go. So like, can a teamster drive me home? Yeah. Yeah. No, no worries. You know? So he like, as if he's doing me a favor, he calls over a teamster and has him drive me home. So I take my bag and stuff and I go home. And I'm of course, you know, I knew it was going to happen. I was very disappointed. And, and, you know, in those days, my answer to everything was get really, really, really pissed off, and I did. Mm. Uh, and I kicked my, you know, my writing room, my where I 
did all my work. I kicked the door open. I went down. I called up a new file, and I wrote the title page, The Boys of Summer, Fade In, literally within an hour. Mm. And that was the original title of the Sandlot, you know, because it was very, very clear that in order to um, put everybody's mind off the nasty thing that these big, powerful people did to this little sort of, you know, virtual unknown, which was me at the time, that I was going to get the, the worst reputation in Hollywood because they were all going to badmouth me, and they did. I mean, from the top to the bottom. He's an idiot. He can't direct. Don't hire him. You know, he's mm. this, he's that. Now, they, could, they couldn't fault my writing, you know, um, and so they couldn't say anything about the script for Radio Flyer and all that. Donner was subsequently called me up two days later and says, kid, you know, you know what happened. You got screwed. They want me to do this, but I'm not going to do it unless you want me to. And I said, yeah, go for it, Dick. He goes, good, come down to my office, you know. He was a very, very compassionate, very kind man, Dick. And uh, so was his wife, Lauren Schiller. And they said, look, live and learn. We're going to go make this movie. You're going to be there every second of the, the way. So they did me a big, big solid. So wow, I could hang good. with him for the entire pre-production, pr- production, post-production, everything. He included me in everything. He was a good, good man. Um, and while we were doing that, I said, the only way I'm ever going to get to direct a movie is if I write something that is so production contained. In other words, there's not 50 uh, locations and, and so on and so forth. And so that's the pr- pragmatic reason that I wrote The Sandlot so that, you know, virtually 70% of the stuff takes place on The Sandlot. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I, don't know, I finished it really, really quick, probably in about five or six weeks. And I had the same agent at the time, and I gave it to him. He goes, home run. He goes, it's going to be a bigger deal than Radio Flyer, and it was, financially. Mm-hmm. But every single studio in Hollywood <laughs> offered me, and I'm talking big seven digits, okay? Going to break, break records again. Way more than I was offered for, uh, for Radio Flyer. And I turned them all down, and there was only a single producer in Hollywood, only one, who called me up and said, hey, I read this thing. It says, it's genius. I love it. We're going to go make this movie. And I go, yeah. He goes, and you're going to direct it. I go, wait, have you checked me out? Because there's a lot. He goes, no, I called everybody. I called all the Columbia people, this, that, everything. And he goes, you know what? Every single one of them said you couldn't direct your way out of a paper bag. This is Mark Berg. And uh, I said, so I don't get it. He goes, they can't all be right. (laughs) <laughs> okay Mark I'm on your team brother let's go and we did and guess what we won yeah you absolutely did wow so that's how that stuff's out uh, so I wanted to close on a, on a happy note you were going to tell me sure. a story about uh, a fan that you ran into at Denver International was it yeah I was changing planes at Denver International and this was a number of years ago I can't remember exactly maybe like maybe like 2007, something like that. And I'm walking along with my backpack, and there's a guy coming toward me, young dad, maybe late 20s, 30 maybe, and he's got like a three or four year old, not, you know, a little bit more than a toddler, but just a squirrel, you know? And dad's got, you know, the backpack and two rolly, you know, uh, duffel bags or whatever, and he, this kid is just cranky and just, you know, getting his four year old on. And the dad's like, come on, buddy, come on, come on, come on, come on. We got to go. We got to get this plane, you know. And he's half begging the kid to shape up, you know, and the kid can't help himself. God love him. Um, they, who knows? Maybe they had a long flight and whatever. And he's just squirrely, squirrely, pulling, pulling. And the dad finally stops as he's within, I swear, maybe like six feet of me, drops his backpack and the bags on the ground right there in the middle of the airport and looks at his kid as I'm passing him shoulder. I mean, I'm a shoulder length uh, width away. He goes, you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> and I stop, and I look at this guy, and he looks at me like, who are you? What do you want? Why are you staring at me? You know, I'm not abusing my kid. You know, and he wasn't. He was just being trying to be the best dad. And uh, I go, um, uh, I said to him, listen, no one is ever going to believe you but I'm going to tell you this, okay? <laughs> and I absolutely never, it's a policy of mine, you nobody know. Some people know my face. I have a tiny amount of fame. I never announce nothing to nobody about nothing about what I do, what I've done and all that. But this guy, I couldn't help myself. 
And I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm the writer, director, and voice of that movie. And he looks at me like, dude, I'm dealing with my kid. You know, who are, you, you're an idiot. Get out of here. I go, no, dude, really? So I show him my driver's license. <laughs> I go, that's me. He goes, you're kidding. I go, no. And you just told your kid you're killing me, Smalls. He goes, yeah. I go, give me your address. So I gave him my address, or he gave me his address. And I said, I'm like, uh, a DVD and a poster and signed to his kid and all that kind of stuff. And uh, to this day, occasionally, he'll email me and go, yeah, I showed somebody the poster again. You're right. They don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one, of the, that's one of the really cool moments. I love it. Oh, that's wonderful. So, so to, to follow you on your, on your road show, where would, should our listeners go? Oh, you can go to a couple of places. The best place is my blog, and it's pretty simple. It's just my name, David Mickey Evans blog dot blogspot dot com, mm-hmm. um, or you just put David Mickey Evans, and I think it's the first thing Google comes up with. And every at the end of every day on this tour, and so far there's been I don't know twenty or so days, I blog about the day's adventures with myself, Navigator Stacy, my uh, beautiful uh, fiance and navigator, and of course our twentieth anniversary Sandlot official mascot and our personal chief of security, Captain Maverick, who is our general German shepherd dog, <laughs> rides in his little command center in the back of the car. And uh, it's, you know, it's a lot about the sound lot. It's a lot about the screenings. It's a lot about us traveling, you know, all through all these states. We're going 20,000 miles and 25 different states in, in six months. And I feel a little bit kind of getting my Bill Bryson on, you know, who's one of my all-time favorites. Um, so, and, you know, I, I try to keep it light and funny and all that. And so far, it's people really dig it. You know, they look forward to the next, um, the next post. And I, you know, feel like I'm a little bit channeling my Dickens, you know, <laughs> a little chapter at a time. Right. So, and, they, and you channeling, can find all the updates about Dickens. Ch- channeling, channeling my Dickens. Dickens. That'll that, be the first yeah, well, interview. That, that's a good there topic. you go. There you go. Are you channeling your Dickens? I think we should make. Yes, yeah, and if you're not, why not? You know, <laughs> trust me, it's well, not that painful. 